I want to welcome all of you for joining us today um, and to give a very warm welcome to the uh, speakers, colleagues from around the region and participants to the Cyber Cafe event. Today, we're launching a study about online violence against women in Asia, uh, which is a key action to mark the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. We want to give a special thanks to the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family from the government of the Republic of Korea for their generous support in order to develop this important research study. My name is Melissa Alvarado. I'm the Ending Violence Against Women Program Manager at UN Women's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, when we first started discussing the idea for this study with the lead researcher, Zarizana Abdulaziz, we wanted to gain a better understanding of online violence against women in this region and seek out promising practices and solutions. We were aware of leading research and reports, for example, by the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. But we really wanted to look at, you know, how is this unfolding in this region? What can we learn from practices around the region? Now, this was before COVID. And of course, COVID has changed all of our lives with the related lockdowns, people being confined to their homes and being online much more than before we see that women have faced a greater risk of online violence and harassment. And I think this has been widely reported in media and other sources. So today we're pleased to discuss the findings from this study with experts from around the region and beyond and gather their insights about the way forward to end online violence against women and girls. Now, as we begin, I want to note that today's session will include content that for some could be upsetting or triggering as we will be discussing violence against women and girls. So I encourage you to please take care of yourselves. And if you need to seek support, we strongly encourage you to do so. Helplines are available in most countries and are available on UN Women's websites uh, for countries around the world. We've, we've done our best to map the available helplines that are, that are currently uh, open for, for callers. If you have young listeners with you, you may wish to be cautious about today's content because there are some that will be sensitive. So having said that, I'm honored to introduce you to the speakers who will be joining this discussion today. Uh, and they are, and you'll see this on the screen in front of you, Sarah Nibs, the Deputy Regional Director for UN Women's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, Zarizana Abdulaziz, Director of the Due Diligence Project and Lead Researcher for this study based in the US, uh, Nigat Dad. Executive Director of the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, Jalen Paklaren, Executive Director of the Women's Legal and Human Rights Bureau in the Philippines, Cindy Southworth, Head of Women's Safety at Facebook based in the US, and Dr. Jiso Yun, Associate Research Fellow at the Korean Women's Development Institute in South Korea. I welcome all of you and thank you so much for joining us today. Now to welcome you all uh, further for today's event, it is my pleasure to invite Sarah Nibs, our Deputy Regional Director, to provide opening remarks. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here to welcome all of you, including today's distinguished speakers, to the launch of this very important landmark report, Online Violence Against Women in Asia, a Multi-Country Study. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Government of the Republic of Korea for generously supporting this research. With the largest number of internet users globally, digital technologies in Asia and the Pacific are bringing vast opportunities. But as this study shows, there's a dark side of these same digital technologies, which can turn them into dangerous tools of oppression, discrimination, abuse, and surveillance. Now globally, we still need to find a comprehensive definition and search for more data on, on ICT technology, I, ICT facilitated violence. But research already shows very clearly that women are disproportionately targeted and suffer serious consequences as a result of such abuse. This online violence often tends to be minimized in the public discourse, but it is not a trivial issue at all. It has damaging and long-lasting impacts on survivors. We know that online forms of violence against women and girls are associated with psychological, social, and reproductive health impacts. These can be life-changing consequences. There are reports of women experiencing high levels of anxiety, depression, 
panic attacks, loss of self-esteem, and feeling powerless in the sense of, in the face of abuse. And in addition, women often withdraw from their online presence when they face such abuse, with all of the consequences that that implies. It's especially timely, as Melissa has already highlighted, that we speak about these issues during the COVID-19 pandemic, because we know that quarantine and self-isolation have increased internet usage between 50 and 70%, as people increasingly have to turn to the internet for work, school and social activities. And online violence is really another face of the violence that women experience offline in the public and private spheres of their lives. While violence against women is certainly not new, including online forms of violence, this has really been exacerbated by isolation from families and support systems and a reduction of crisis services that are a lifeline for many. Women and girls are subject to a to surprising and alarming array of online violence. Online violence against women in Asia, a multi-country study, was conducted in five countries, India, Malaysia, Pakistan, the Philippines, and the Republic of Korea. In each country, the research looked at the, man at the manifestations of online violence against women and girls, the measures being taken by states and ICT intermediaries to prevent and respond to it, as well as the perceptions of civil society organizations about it. And one of the reasons this study is really valuable is because it brings forward the insights from frontline service providers who speak directly with the survivors of such violence. Their first-hand experience plays a key role in highlighting some of the existing gaps in policies and practices to better deal with such violence. The study allows us to better understand the realities in these five countries related to online violence against women, to see the commonalities among them, including challenges and promising practices to address the issue. It's increasingly urgent to address the growing trend of online violence in order to empower women and ensure their participation in the increasingly important digital sphere. Eliminating online violence against women and girls requires political will, expertise and collaboration among internet intermediaries, technology communities, civil society, governments and the public. Thus, it is really critical to bring together governments, development organizations and researchers in the region to allow the online community to better identify, report, block and remove hateful content, to build social media literacy and to counter disinformation. And in some contexts, this will include the need to expand legislation to criminalize some of the, some cyber harassment and stalking where this does not yet exist. For the digital world to reach its full potential, it must be shaped with the participation of women. Having more women leaders in the technical community and the governance of the internet is needed to make women's experiences and perspectives visible within the industry. And by applying the same drive for innovation to seriously challenge this insidious form of violence against women that we know digital technologies and companies excel in, will have game-changing results. We call for a renewed commitment to invest in solutions that will create safer and accountable online spaces for everyone. For long-term solutions and for distribution of information about online safety, we must also actively engage women's rights organizations to develop guidance and good practices on safe and inclusive online spaces for women and girls. We must always keep our eyes on preventing all forms of violence against girls and women, online or offline, by creating gender equitable societies that reject all forms of violence. This means teaching our children, both girls and boys, about consent and respectful relationships. This is at the heart of a future that does not include violence. And here too, we need to invest in deeply in growing the roots that will support current and future generations to live free from violence. I look forward very much to hearing about solutions to address this difficult issue during today's event. We hope that this report, along with the wider 16 days of activism campaign, will provide us with new evidence and ideas to eliminate online violence against women and girls during this particular period of crisis that we're all living through at the moment and for the future. In closing, on behalf of UN Women, I just want to reiterate my gratitude for the speaker's time and commitment and to our partners in the government of the Republic of Korea. I look forward very much to the engaging discussions we will have today with a remarkable lineup of speakers. And thank you all very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, you have highlighted how important it is for women and girls to be safe online. And I think we're all very conscious that having women and girls present as we rebuild, as we build a more resilient future following COVID-19 
it's, it's essential to have women and girls part of that, to allow them to be the solution builders, innovators, contributors that, 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 that we are. Uh, and and we, need to, we need to get a better handle on this issue of, of online violence. So next, I would like to introduce and welcome Zarizana Abdulaziz, the lead researcher for this study. Her knowledge and passion through the due diligence project is well known. Uh, so Zari, we would like to welcome you to share the key findings from the study and the learnings that emerged from it. So we'll get the slides uh, on the screen. There we go. Over to you, Zari. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, can I have a slide first, please? First page. Yeah, we've heard. Good, good, um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We've heard just now about how more than half the world's population are on the internet. But this research also looks at the mobile phone because we, ca we cannot forget that a lot of women don't have access to smartphones, but they still get harassed online through their mobile phones. The internet has great potential. Yeah? Again, it's undermined by high levels of ICT violence. And with COVID, although this research was conducted pre-COVID, well, almost, it was uh, July to December of last year, I think its importance have increased through the pandemic uh, response where ICT has become almost the primary means of communication, both for work, for news, for, you know, relationships. Next page, please. As mentioned, it's a five country re research. So it was done with a survey that was distributed, distributed to civil society, the death research, uh, government officials, interviews with civil societies, ICT intermediaries, uh, and triangulation, of course. Next page. The key question, how does ICT vow manifest itself? I'll go through a few of the examples in the next slide. What do states do? What are their measures? But critically, what is their impact? And for this, we went to civil society organizations. Why? Yeah. Because for violence against women, especially civil society and the social movements are critical. On violence against women have always have been pushed by civil society and the identification of issues, the shaping of the optimal response and often predating government responses. And lastly, ICT intermediaries. How do they prevent and respond to violence against women? Now, what are ICT intermediaries? They're not just technology companies these days. They don't just host. Yeah? They do more than that. And they are really critical influences of public and private opinion. And in this study, I've included mobile phone providers. Next page, please. Violence against women is gender-based violence. It's directed at a woman because she is a woman or that affects women disproportionately. And it's committed or facilitated through the use of ICT. We know that often violence against men and against women, they manifest themselves differently. And for women, it very quickly deteriorates to sexual abuse, rape threats, body shaming, um, cyber, uh, mob attacks. Next page, please. Now, what are the types of ICT vow that we're looking? It keeps evolving, but for now, um, these are the lists I have uh, identified sexist, misogynist, hate speech. And together with cyberbullying, the two have great impact on women. For example, um, we know about the celebrity, the Korean celebrity, Suli. She was mob attack, hate speech, and finally it led to her taking her own life. Yeah. Uh, Non-consensual sexting, this is important because remember, it also happens on the phone. Non-consensual dissemination of intimate images, this is a bit sticky because of the issue of the consent has to be to the dissemination, not the creation of the image. And this is what happens, uh, this actually is what happens that underlines women's fears when they come to complain about this. Because then the focus is and has been, why do you create, create this image? Doxing. Um, doxing is the release of uh, private inf information, but often sometimes with the invitation to have sex. So this is my address, 
come, I love having sex. And then you get, you know, all sorts of men coming to your door. And uh, trading of rape videos in lieu of now uh, pornography. So you're not only raped, but those videos are then traded digital voyeurism. Now you have cameras that are, let's say, smaller than my, um, you know, my pinky nail. And it can be hidden in changing rooms, in hotel rooms, and it's either live stream or uh, then I'll trade it again, or used for sextortion. Yeah, that's another term. It's used to, uh, as a blackmail, to get uh, more sexual images from you. Cyber flashing uh, and morphing. That is taking somebody's photo and putting it on uh, a naked picture, for example. And this happened also, for example, in Pakistan, a lot of college students, they were uh, threatened by this one, uh, you know, two guys who did this. Next page. How prevalent is violence against women? In a study, 85% of all Korean women have experienced gender hate speech. Yeah. In India, another study, 58% of women respondents have said they have faced online violence and women with intersecting identities are regularly targeted. Uh, especially, and if you have a high profile human rights defenders, journalists, politicians, they're frequently attacked. In Pakistan, I met a journalist who said, I no longer write about political issues because I've been attacked. Yeah. Now, online violence is not trivial. The problem is, because sometimes there's no physical impact, is trivialized. Yeah? But we have seen how the harm of online violence is amplified. It's amplified because of the easy rapid transmission. It's amplified uh, because of the participation of secondary perpetrators. That is, if you see uh, a, violent, a violent material, instead of deleting it, you download it, you share, you online transmit it. Now, every time that happens, it's another online violence incident. Yeah. And the other thing is we are all trained to interact uh, face to face. Yeah. And that's our social mores. Now, when we interact online is to a screen where it seems it's a victimless crime, but it's not. The anonymity of it, yeah. the disinhibition, it has been shown that people act out more, but they also disclose more. And so that both of them uh, amplifies online violence. Next slide, please. The findings disclose, disclose that victim survivors rarely or never report. And if they report at all, it may be to internet intermediaries. Why? Because of lack of confidence in the police, uh, lack of confidence in the judicial pro process, and most of all fear of being blamed. Yeah. Uh, we have seen this, especially with uh, women reporting and instead of uh, the perpetrator who disseminated the content being charged, she could be charged under obscenity laws. That is her creating the or, or consenting to the, in, uh, the video being created. And this even extends to child pornography. A girl under age was charged for child pornography because she shared with someone a video of her having oral sex and that person then disseminated that video and instead of looking at that she was charged and registered as a sex offender uh, for child pornography. Next slide please. Now as far as prevention programs go, they are, if, there, if there are any at all, it's not in, they normally focus on cyber bullying or safe internet use but rarely if ever on ICT VAL. Awareness programs often focus on disinformation, misinformation, and there's a scarcity of programs on internet etiquette. Now, what is internet etiquette? Yeah. It's how to behave online, what to do when you see, uh, you know, someone being mob attacked, uh, what to do when you receive violent content, what is the culture that we want to create uh, online, and also prevention uh, programs. They have to end be engaging. This top-down approach of getting someone to talk to, especially the young, uh, that has been shown not to uh, work as effectively. Next slide. Also, there's a question of uneven protection. We've seen states with stronger laws. For example, Germany uh, some, some time back passed a law that made network uh, social platforms, for example, responsible if they do not take down 
violent content within 24 hours uh, or face a fine of 50 million. Now that spurred uh, a lot of technological com technology companies to actually engage thousands of people to work on, uh, you know, uh, on German content. But what does that mean to us, to countries like India, Pakistan, Malaysia, Philippines, yeah, uh, South Korea? There, so uh, this uneven protection. Then the response, of course, states normally go to criminali criminalization. Yeah, but with criminalization, you may have uh, specific laws like India, even specific courts like Pakistan, uh, special investigators. But that effective implementation, it still requires a change of mindset of the police that when someone goes in to report, uh, they look at online violence as an offense. Yeah. And of course, uh, when creating these laws, we also have to be mindful of freedom of expression, yeah. uh, that it should not be too broad and uh, used um, to extend censorship, for example. Now the recommendations. Next slide, please. A state must hold themselves accountable. They must feel that they're accountable. After all, states perpetuate culture, uh, they incarnate culture. And we have seen how states lead leadership have changed the way uh, violent culture uh, manifests itself. Yeah? Uh, of course, it has to be survivor-centered approach. Yeah? Uh, looking at the prevention and the response to digital gender-based violence, for example, in Korea. And online platforms have to be conscious that they have a responsibility, a human rights responsibility to protect, respect and remedy. Now taking this offline, for example, if a business runs a restaurant and that restaurant is used consistently by customers to transact, let's say, uh, drug trafficking or even human trafficking, the owner of the restaurant surely will be responsible. And in some places, you may lose your license, you may even forfeit your property. So we have to get internet intermediaries into this mindset that online violence happening on that platform uh, will attract accountability. Next slide. Prevention. Yeah. Now again, the changing of mindset and the modifying of behaviors, yeah, promoting digital security. How do we remove uh, misogyny, hate? And again, that culture building, uh, remove the toxicity, the behavior. The counter narrative, how, does, how do states and intermediaries and users create this counter narrative? What is a proper bystander intervention? Yeah, certainly not passing on the violent content, uh, the least of which could be just reporting. Yeah. User-friendly community rules. We've seen pages and pages of legal jargon that pass off as community rules. Legally is sound, but hardly anyone reads it. Everyone wants to just get on board start the application, create the videos, use TikTok or whatever. Uh, so this uh, community rules have to be broken down into something that, you know, that users can understand and it has to be, uh, you know, flashed easily. Now, simple pop-up. Every time I try to upload something, there's a warning. Do you own copyright to this? Yeah. Now, copyright as a property concept is different. Why can't we have a pop-up to say, have you gotten the consent of the subject matter of this material? Yeah. Now, copyright looks at the ownership of the person, the photographer who created the image. But we are not objects in this image. We are subjects. Yeah. And we need to understand that subjects of images have dignity and have rights. And that has to be emphasized. Next slide, please. Collaboration and consultation. Of course, est establishing multi-holder consultative body with government, civil society, states, uh, online platforms, intergovernmental organizations should collaborate and, and intermediaries should cooperate and share information across platforms. We have seen how the violent content traverse, traverses from platform to platform. And if intermediaries share, are more quick to share, we can stop this quickly because once it goes out, it is very, very difficult to remove. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, universal norms, yeah. Uh, intermediaries have said they need a clear definition of what is online violence. Uh, we can create that, have it applicable to every country. So when having the same standards applicable in Germany as in India or Pakistan, uh, accountability of bystanders, understanding what is 
and emphasizing that what is welcome and unwelcome material, what is consensual, what is non-consensual, the consent to the taking, the consent to the sharing, consent is a very, uh, you know, consent is a very specific idea and consent only applies to what the consent is about. Yeah? And to rethink the notions of this, of what is ownership, what is dignity, uh, I've spoken about this. Next slide, please. And inclusion and diversity. We have seen several months ago, a plugin was created, yeah? uh, and the algorithm was trained to identify uh, cyber flashing, yeah? to identify and to filter it. And this all came about because the tech person was herself cyber flashed. And I can't help thinking that if the tech community was more diverse and inclusive, women would have caught this. You have to put women in there, women who face the violence to be part of the solution. Yeah. Uh, we have to sensitize the industry, industry to women's needs and perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, sanctions and reparations. Strengthen reporting mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, with, um, make it transparent, make it quick. Expand the sanctions and remedies. Criminalization, throwing someone in jail may not be the most effective uh, sanction uh, because for a lot of people, their social platform has become their lifeline, so to speak. If the sanction is related to, for example, that platform, then it may be effective. And also women are put to spending thousands each month to remove content, to engage professionals to do it. The perpetrator has to be made accountable and pay for this restitution. Even an apology might go some way and compensation. Uh, of course, then to facilitate the victim survivor's rebuilding of her online violence. How does she get back online after having her presence uh, you know, attacked? And lastly, I have to say women Taking themselves offline because of violence is not an option. It's certainly not an option during COVID, post-COVID, it's not an option moving forward. So we have to do something about this and we can do something about this. Thank you. Thank you, Zari, uh, for presenting these key findings and underlining the recommendations as you have, which really spell out roles for businesses, governments, and civil society and, and beyond to really get a better handle on this issue. Uh, and I think you've given us quite a lot to, to discuss. And so I would now invite the speakers who are part of our event today to join a cyber cafe discussion to share their thoughts on the findings and recommendations of this research. We will be uh, hearing their reflections about the study uh, based on where they sit in, in their country context or in their sector experience and to hear more from them about some of the concrete actions that can be taken to address online violence against women and girls in this region and beyond. So what I will do now is share a few of the select findings from the study with each speaker and ask for your insights. So first, I would like to share a study finding with Nigat Dad from Pakistan to hear her views. And the finding is this. Civil society organizations and advocates indicate that victims or survivors rarely or never report online violence to the authorities. So my question to Nagat is, what is your experience related to survivors reporting online violence against women and girls from the Pakistan context? What will enable survivors to seek and receive help from the authorities? So over to you, Nagat. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you so much, Zarizana, for uh, sharing uh, findings of the report. I think it's a landmark report. Uh, um, we have been uh, releasing reports uh, from Pakistan, but I haven't seen a uh, multi-country report and in this comprehensive. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think keeping in mind Pakistani uh, context um, and the patriarchal sort of setup of the society, mostly women and young girls are in any way uh, hesitant to go to the police station or to uh, the cybercrime banks to report online violence against them. Um, and um, I think some of the reasons that why they, um, they are hesitant to report is 
first uh, they do not find the supporting mechanisms around them so the immediate support system like the family or uh, you know the, the 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 school or university or friends and i think the the main reason is the the shame and stigma that is attached to the online violence against women and the forms of online violence against women especially when it comes to non consensual use of intimate images the fear that when they will go to the uh, 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 law enforcement agency uh, they will be victim blamed um, and i think the very important uh, issue that mostly survivors have raised with us uh, at our helpline that how my my data will be secured will be the uh, will be the law enforcement agencies and i think that's a very ve valid question in absence of any data protection or privacy policies they are hesitant to submit uh, their data as an evidence because that's the first thing that the law enforcement asks uh, survivors to submit to pursue their cases um, another important thing we have seen that it's not just one uh, stakeholder that needs to focus on their, uh, you know, uh, on their training or building capacity. I have, we have seen over the course of years around working on this issue that it's, uh, it's something where judges need, they need, they need to be trained through judicial academies, uh, prosecution, investigation officers. Uh, it's a lack of awareness and a lack of understanding of this issue and they bring the uh, cultural you know police behavior in the law enforcement that actually uh, stops the victim because the 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 police reforms is still happening in pakistan it's a very problematic um, uh, patriarchal behavior they have towards the survivors and the same behavior we we see in the law enforcement when it comes to uh, the cyber crime wings um, another thing is the which Zarizana has also mentioned the uh, misuse of cyber crime laws so i think we also need to be very very cautious that the laws that we make in the name of protecting women and girls uh, uh, against the online violence and harassment those tend to sometimes use against them or use against other very important marginalized uh, and vulnerable groups uh, so there is a hesitation that i'm not going to use such law and i think uh, it's this sec responding to to the second part of your question that what what is needed and how we can sort of address this effectively i personally feel political will is so much needed without the political will uh, of the government you like lots of things that we are talking about we cannot do this until or unless they are willing to do it and having more women on the decision making table who can talk about women's experiences i think that's very important because even government is willing to uh, work on these issues when you have no woman in the decision making uh, process the the kind of policies that you see are very male dominated and doesn't really carry uh, women's experiences um, I think important to have data protection laws and supporting mechanisms when uh, when uh, and and to make an environment of uh, uh, of reporting cyber cyber violence uh, by women especially in, in patriarchal or very conservative society to make it more uh, viable for them so that they know that their data is safe they know that they won't be victim blamed they know that there are women prosecutors and investigation officers who can deal with them. most of the time women don't even go because they know that they will have to speak to a man and that sort of you know stops them to go to the law enforcement and I think oh, uh, I, 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 we will be talking about this in next few questions also, but I think very important thing is when we talk about the training of judges, we are also talking about developing a good jurisprudence if you have any laws in the country. I think bad jurisprudence is also a factor where, you know, um, uh, you don't have like a good law and the, the court cases are not setting good precedent. And then it's not really, you know, helping the entire ecosystem to address the cyber harassment. Thank you so much, Nigat. You've raised a whole host of really critical issues. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I think that, you know, you're pointing to 
a lot of systemic issues is, is really valuable. You know, we really have to treat this as an ongoing systemic issue where we need to see that our legal responders are ready and have a full understanding of what are the dynamics of violence? What does this do to people's lives, right? In order to be able to utilize the legislation that's available in country. And I, I appreciate your, your pointing out that the political will needs to be behind that, that action and that, that driving uh, force needs to be there um, with, with the backing of government. So, so thank you for pointing out those key issues. Um, I'm now gonna turn to Jalen from the Philippines. Uh, Jalen Pak Lawrence. So the, the finding that I'm going to ask you to, to respond to is about prevention. Now, the report states that when prevention programs exist, for example, in schools, they tend to focus on cyberbullying and safe internet use. However, it seems that the awareness programs for the general public often emphasize dissemination of information, misinformation, and don't typically really get to the focus of online violence against women and girls. So Jalen, my question for you, what is your perspective regarding the availability of prevention programs online? And what do you think holds promise to prevent online violence? Thank you, um, Jalen. Good, yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Melissa. And uh, thank you, Sari, for sharing the findings of this research. Um, we are happy actually that we have this kind of research because I remember in 2015, we also did a multi-country research and at that time, uh, data gathering is rather more difficult because um, less people wanted to talk about this. And it's good that we continue to talk about ICT violence against women against, ICT violence against women and girls. So um, Melissa, I think um, we need to also discuss why prevention is important, no? Um, uh, the important fact about um, programs on prevention is that violence can be prevented. It can be prevented. Uh, learning how to respect the decision of the woman or recognize consent uh, provided by a woman can really prevent vow if we are just conscious and we, we stop assuming that it's okay to harass women online and offline. Um, prevention also guarantees that all spaces should be safe, no? both online and offline. However, however, prevention programs are sometimes not a priority of government. We need to ensure that women and girls are safe in online and offline spaces. Appropriating budget and prioritizing prevention programs can do a lot of things no? to change the norms and behaviors toward ICT vouchy and prevent it. For example, um, we can develop materials, especially in social media, on what to do and not to do online, including instances when a woman chose to share her intimate moments with her partner. partners. This can be done both by governments and uh, ICT intermediaries and platforms like FB, IG, Twitter, uh, including dating apps. No, uh, I think they can also use their platforms to also educate women and all users. Uh, second, um, campaigns like Think Before You Click Perspective captures the basic etiquette on, in online spaces. No? But still, this is not enough to change how ICT violence against women is viewed in society in general. Women and girls continue to suffer and become victims in online spaces. Uh, law enforcers, given that we most of us are staying at home, law enforcers can do web, webinar series and share cases that they receive, for example. And these cases can be used no, as a platform to raise awareness on women and girls. This is what we are doing in WLB. We're doing webinar series and we use the cases that we receive to um, inform the public what they can do and how to prevent such kind of, um, of violence. Um, and I think that would be good also to make to make it known to make it known make it known to the potential perpetrator that the crime he commit uh, that, that, that there is a crime that, he, that that has been committed and there is repercussion. I think we need to to inform the public that it's a criminal act and there are uh, corresponding penalties. We have to understand that the problem with ICT vouchers is systemic and pros and uh, systemic, no? And prosecution of such crimes are transboundary in nature, intractable, and at the same time, there's a need to address the issue of territoriality and jurisdiction. In the Philippines now, women's bodies and sexuality has been used to target women online, especially if they have differing opinion. Moreover, our cultural norms and beliefs are weaponized to silent women in online spaces, whether by their family members, community, or state. 
I think what we wanted to uh, really pursue when we talk about a prevention program is that violence has no place in our society. It must stop whether in online or offline spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jalen. Uh, that was really powerful. Again, you, you touched on quite, quite a lot of issues uh, that, that we'll uh, continue to reflect on throughout this session. I mean, I think I really liked where you started saying, look, prevention, it is possible to prevent violence against women and girls. And I think that's an, an increasingly common uh, statement that we're, we're hearing and a message that we're, that we're all promoting. We are starting to see much more evidence now about what actually works to prevent violence. I think a lot of advocates over the years have become frustrated, feeling like, look, we're doing all this awareness raising, but this is not, not, not getting us where we need to go. We're not feeling like it's having the effect. And we're learning more through evidence and through practice, uh, right? Through programs and evaluations and research about what works. And so I think that your message is, is really important here that we do know, we are starting to know much more about what works to prevent violence against women and girls, and we can apply it here. And as you said, that includes speaking to young people before they become perpetrators or victims or survivors, right? We really want to reach people before they get into these difficult situations and perhaps you know, um, harm somebody uh, when perhaps they didn't know that that would be harmful. So you've given us a lot of really, really critical pieces and thank you for that. Uh, so next I'm going to turn my attention to Dr. Ji So Yoon. Uh, and, and the finding that I'm going to ask you to reflect on is regarding uh, state measures, which mostly focus on legislation that criminalize online platforms, sometimes uh, carrying sentences of imprisonment and fines, sometimes with specialized law enforcement, personnel, law enforcement personnel, prosecutors, and courts. So my question to you is, based on your research and experience in the South Korean context, what do you think holds promise to stop online violence against women and girls? Over to you, Jisoo. Well, thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you for such a great report. Um, well, the South Korean government has uh, come up with and adopted a number of measures and policies to counter online violence against women. And I won't repeat my uh, repeat here because the report already talks about a lot of them. But I'd like to highlight and bring your attention to a recent revision of the law uh, that was passed in the National Assembly. It was actually a set of bills to strengthen punishment for digital sex crimes. But um, What's important is that it includes uh, sentencing up to three years in prison or a fine of up to 30, about $30,000 to not only people who just buy uh, or watch illegally fil filmed obscene uh, materials or videos, but for simply possessing them, uh, people could be uh, punished. Uh, and so this, uh, th I mean, uh, in addition to this and other measures, I believe these efforts are um, definitely changes um, in the right direction. Um, the necessary steps that have uh, that need uh, that needs to be taken, but um, I think it's also important to acknowledge uh, that there are aspects of online violence against women and girls that exist but is hardly recognized as such in our society. And I believe violence against uh, female public figures is one of them. The report actually talks and mentions this, talks about this. And I also think uh, gendered hate speech is um, another example. And so um, as the report shows, actually experts believe that these are important and um, emerging um, components of online violence against women and girls. But among the public, I think there's still uh, very little awareness. Um, and so I think these examples show how, how large the scope of online violence against uh, women can be and how difficult it is to define that scope um, and to come up with effective measures for each. And so I think the next important step is to recognize these other areas of online violence uh, against women and girls that might be more prevalent um, in our society to today, but has uh, not been paid much attention at, um, until today, and to come up with effective me measures and legislations to, um, to counter, counter them. 
Very good, very good. I really like your uh, mentioning this issue related to what happens to online fe well, female public figures and, and the response that they get from public, which is often uh, abusive, uh, sexually harassing, you know, there's all kinds of horrible threats uh, that happen to a lot of female public figures. And this really speaks to uh, what we said earlier in this, in this event today, that we really need to see more women in leadership roles Right, we really need to see women in decision-making bodies. You know that includes our parliaments, that includes local government, and so this type of violence is directly challenging women's ability to to be successful, to be seen, uh, to 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 remain in these in these roles. And so I think there's a really critical link there. And, and you're right, this is mentioned in the report, and I think it deserves uh, far more attention. Uh, and, and perhaps research uh, than, than we currently have. So you're raising a very critical issue and I think that we'll be returning to that. Thank you so much, Chiso. Okay, so for the next finding, I'm going to turn our attention to Cindy Southworth uh, from Facebook. And the finding that I'm gonna ask uh, Cindy to, to consider is, is the following. So the respondents favored expanding possible sanctions to include ordering perpetrators to have content removed and delinked from searches as well as fines and restitutions. We heard Zari present about that earlier today. So the question for you, Cindy, drawing on your experience at Facebook, what do you think needs to happen to improve the ability of online platforms to address online violence against women and girls? Over to you, Cindy. Thank you, Melissa. It really is a pleasure to be here. If somebody had told me 20 years ago when I founded the Safety Net Technology Project at the US National Network to End Domestic Violence, and I was talking about Netscape and answering machine cassette tapes, if you all remember those, if somebody had said I would be on a panel with phenomenal experts from around the world and talking with UN women about how do we end online violence against women, I would have been just completely flabbergasted. So this is a real, real pleasure. Um, in my current role as the head of women's safety, I joined in July after 30 years in the nonprofit sector working to end gender-based violence. And in the work that I'm doing at Facebook, it's you know very clear that you have to have a holistic, comprehensive approach. You have to have the right policies that get at the harassing behavior. You have to have the right enforcement mechanisms. You have to have proactive detection and machine learning so that nobody ever sees the content ideally. And you know, for example, with hate speech, we've gotten really good with the machine learning and 95% of hate speech is deleted before anyone sees it. Unfortunately, that still means there's 5% that's on the platform that relies on people who see it to report it. So we want to get those numbers up even higher. But, you know, it's policies, tools, detection, and then partnerships. We have to have, you know, groups like academic experts and NGO civil society working together and I really believe all the major social media companies need to do something similar. You can't just address it with one approach. You know, changing policies alone is not enough. Having partnerships alone is not enough. Machine learning alone is not enough. And ultimately for me, we absolutely have to partner with the public sector, governments, civil society, other private sector, because we have to change culture. We can get the best machine learning ever and abusers and stalkers will still try to game the system. They'll find a way to modify what they're doing. They'll, they'll eat the way, they'll find a way around the policies and find a way around our enforcement. So I want to raise a generation of young people that it never can, never occurs to them that they would post something threatening, harassing, or non-consensual in any space, online or off. And so, you know, that's a long-term solution that we need to be working on. And we're Facebook's actually trying to embark on something with you and women on norms changing, culture change, because we really do believe the tools are required, but ultimately abusers and stalkers are going to find a way around them unless we do that that very necessary culture change with very young children. Um, so I'm just thrilled to be here and very uh, pleased to see the report findings. Thanks for including me. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, yeah, I mean, we are, I think, all very mindful that we need to be having, as you say, more comprehensive conversations, these partnerships where we can build builds new solutions. And I mean, sort of like what we're doing here today with this report, bringing forward the perspectives, the incredible insights that these frontline service providers have been, have been absorbing, have been you know, coming to these realizations 
and blending that with the learning and the innovation that happens you know, on the side of the ICT intermediaries, these online companies um, to play, a, 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 let's say a better and better role in terms of not only catching the content, but yes, getting better at learning how to prevent and to do that, that social norms change. So we're so pleased that, that you can be part of today's discussion. So next, what I'd like to do is, um, now we're gonna shift our attention to some of the recommendations of the report. So we've heard about the issues. We'd like to talk to now um, views around some of those recommendations. So for those of you who are reading the report, I know the link has been put into the chat box um, and it's available online. Uh, we wanna speak to some of these recommendations and you've all in various ways spoken to the importance of prevention. And we really know this is what's cutting edge. This is where we need to be going. We are all, those of us who've been, you know, focusing on violence against women for decades, we're tired. We wanna, we wanna see uh, our children. We wanna see ourselves live in, live in, live in societies that, that are free from violence. And so we really are committed to getting better and better at evidence-based uh, interventions that can effectively prevent violence before it happens. And so I wanna to turn to Nagat again and ask uh, about your perspective related to prevention. So one recommendation of the study was that prevention strategies need to aim to change mindsets and modify behaviors both online and offline. Of course, online is a reflection of, of what we believe and what we do offline. So this requires teaching not only women and girls, but to all digital media users, including boys and men, to alter online behavior, the internet culture and harmful notions of masculinity. So my question for you, Nagat, what do you see as key approaches to prevent online violence against women? Over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I guess, M Melissa, this is a very important um, intervention. I, um, in our work initially, uh, when I started at working around online violence against women, my focus were women. And um, I think uh, keeping in mind the the kind of um, um, setup we have here in Pakistan, the the the, the patriarchal um, society where women they they are not really comfortable talking about their experiences in the presence of men, uh, and and we we know that it's a male dominated society. Uh, I think our our experience was to normalize. Uh, the conversation around online violence against women and cre create a safe space for women so that they can talk about their experiences safely and securely and openly. And in last few years, we have realized that it's so important to add young men and boys in our conversations because unfortunately, most of the time, the uh, the kind of violence that women face in the country uh, they it, it, it comes from men and boys uh, and um, and even from the ed educated ones who actually do not understand that what constitute misogyny or uh, hate speech or um, um, you know like toxic masculinity and I think it's important to share our idea of toxicity, hate, and uh, harassment with them. And when we have started talking to men, uh, they're mo most of the time their response is, oh, you know, but I didn't thought, I didn't think that it was, uh, it was a harassment or it, uh, it was a hate speech towards women. I was just talking normally. So, you know, that presents the idea of a normal society where you know, men don't even realize, or you know, people don't realize that this constitute uh, misogyny or hate speech or trolling or harassment. So I think important for the civil society organizations, uh, organizations who are working towards, uh, uh, you know, addressing this issue, government, law enforcement, uh, mo mo most of the time government and law enforcement has a focus on, on criminalization of these uh, crimes instead of focusing on you know uh, uh, raising awareness or educating people and i think uh, we really need to add men in our conversations uh, and also need to tell them that you know they need to listen to us not to hijack the conversation so i think it's like very important how we can include all people especially men uh, who are mostly responsible for such kind of behavior but 
Melissa, having said that, I would also like to point out what Cindy said uh, around what platforms are doing. I think, uh, you know, when we are talking about preventive measures, it's important to see what, how platforms are addressing these issues and who they are talking to. Are they talk only talking to the people living in the West or are they are talking to people living in the global South as well? Because when it comes to um, uh, automation tools or uh, training algorithms, most of the time the hate speech is not recognized, the hate speech in the regional languages, it's not recognized by the algorithms of these platforms. So I think what kind of representation we have, you know, when uh, when platforms reach out to the different stakeholders. And the third thing is, you know, having uh, resources like cyber harassment helpline. We have one in Pakistan, uh, and we started it like uh, four years ago. And I think it's a good preventive. Um, resource because most of the time women do not want to go to the law enforcement because of lots of things we have discussed earlier. So there should be some mechanism which sort of bridge the gap between the, uh, the bridge the you know the the trust uh, deficit between the government law enforcement and the woman. Um, so yeah, that's 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 it from my side. Very good, thank you. And I, I really appreciate you adding that last point at the end about making sure that we are moving into the spaces and that we're clearly paying attention to uh, what languages that we're, we're, we're using to, to do this uh, machine learning, right? And to continually improve. I mean, I think that there's, there's probably a lot, a lot to be done there. Uh, there's huge populations that are not, you know, uh, communicating in English, and we definitely need to be paying attention to those spaces. And, um, you know, there's, there's plenty being done in that space, but agree with you, there's, there's, there's plenty more to be done. Um, in addition, I mean, you've raised a really critical bit, uh, a critical piece related to, um, you know, who are we talking with about these problems? Yes, we need to have those spaces that are safe for women, because as you pointed out, Women are not always comfortable to share what, what they're really experiencing, um, how they're affected by some of their experiences, including through online violence. So we need to maintain those spaces so we can truly you know, uh, absorb uh, what, what, what we're hearing from women. However, uh, we, we don't wanna miss the opportunity to be engaging with men and boys and have a dialogue about those same issues as you've, as you've underlined. And I think, a lot of programming over the years has evolved in a similar way. You know, we've really started, you know, really first wanting to understand with women what's happening to women um, and what solutions do they see. But yes, at, at some point we need to be really opening up this conversation and asking men, you know, how do you see yourselves in this picture? How do you see yourselves communicating with other men about this issue, including our, our sons and, and, and boys in our, in, our, in our universe? So um, those are some really critical bits. Thank you so much, Nikat, for, for, for adding those. Okay, so now I wanna take the, an opportunity to return again to Jalen and speak to her uh, about another recommendation in the report. And this one's related to a survivor-centered approach. And so in, in this recommendation, it states that a survivor-centered approach to women's access to justice, along with gender responsive laws and policies will, will foster confidence in the legal process and an effective enforcement of the law. This involves ease of reporting, you know, really having that sensitive uh, uh, treatment that, that survivors and, and victims would like to see, the familiarity and technical know-how of first responders and those conducting investigations, as well as I would say on the prosecution side, and that we're seeing suitable charges, um, for example, against invasion of privacy and not really just focusing on obscenity laws, as, as Zari has already pointed out, and the protection of victims and survivors from reprisals. So that's a, a long recommendation, but Jalen, the question for you, what do you think can be done to ensure a survivor-centered approach when responding to the allegations of online violence against women and girls? Over to you. Um, uh, thank you for that question, uh, Melissa. Um, I think uh, what we wanted to highlight when we speak of survivor-centered approach is that the first encounter with the victim is very important. Uh, structures and institutions in place should be able to guarantee that the mechanism in place uh, will understand their situation and will facilitate their access to justice. Thus, to ensure a survivor-centered approach, protocols uh, developed 
there should be a protocol that should be developed. And uh, this protocol developed by law enforcers, for example, in the case of the Philippines, we have just recently passed a Republic Act 11313 or the Safe Spaces Act. And that law should, uh, garage, that law actually mandated um, law enforcement agencies and investigative uh, units to ensure that services are adequate, accessible, uh, the, uh, guarantees are mandated those units to ensure that there are protocols developed to address online gender-based sexual harassment. And when we speak of protocols, these protocols should also, so should also ensure that those services are adequate, accessible, timely, gender sensitive sensitive and will address the needs of the victim. I think that's what actually encapsulate what a survivor-centered approach is. Uh, and hopefully this will not contribute to further trivialization of ICT violence against women uh, and girls and the normalization that online vow is, accept is acceptable because there is no physical body to start with. No? Uh, I think that's the challenge in most um, law enforcement agencies that they think that it is not a violation because there is no physical body to start with. But we as advocates, as activists, we would like to tell otherwise. In the Philippines also, um, schools and private institutions, as we have been discussing, are where we usually spend half of our life. So Safe Spaces Act should be able to guarantee that these institutions um, uh, should be able to ensure that, no? to ensure that it will really promote safe spaces. They should know that they are solidarily liable. It's not just the perpetrator, but also the institutions like uh, private institutions, schools, that they are liable uh, in ensuring and preventing online gender-based harassment, protect the victim, and hold the perpetrator liable no? through, of course, fair investigation. So I think that's uh, basically what I wanted to say when we speak of a survivor-centered approach. And we hope that this can really be implemented, not um, in reality, because it's still a continuing challenge, even in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jalen. And it's true. I mean, we, we see that uh, the Philippines has some very well-established laws and policies that, you know, we, we see as... as um, uh, as promising in terms of, you know, their potential to support survivors in, 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 in a very comprehensive way. And yet, as you point out, you know, we really have to still be examining the ability of institutions uh, to implement fully and effectively. And I think um, you're pointing out that schools as well, you know, need to take on that institutional approach. And, and we are very conscious that we, we have to move beyond you know, sort of training people. And instead, we want to see that, you know, entire professions, you know, entire classes of, uh, you know, employees such as health workers, such as teachers, social workers, lawyers, police officers, right? They have this institutional built-in learning and an expectation that um, they will be responding to survivors in a very sensitive way that is really informed by the experiences of women and survivors themselves. So your points are very well taken, Jolyn, thank you. Okay, so next I'm gonna turn back to Cindy. Um, and this recommendation is related to the coordination among online platforms. And so you've spoken to that a bit already, Cindy. I think that there's a lot of curiosity about you know, how are online platforms uh, coordinating and, and what would we like to see perhaps happen more you know, to, to do better. And so the recommendation is that online platforms have already taken initial steps to collaborate with civil society organizations and advocates. The next step is to explore ways in which online platforms may alert each other of online bot content and collaborate to quickly remove it as it travels across platforms and networks. So the question for you, Cindy, how has Facebook taken steps to collaborate with CSOs and advocates? Uh, and what do you see as some promising next, next steps for collaboration, including among other, other online platforms? Over to you, Cindy. Thanks, Melissa. And that question is very um, interwoven with the question from Naomi about what mechanisms or staff resources should social media companies create. So I'm going to answer both at the same time and very efficiently um, meet two goals. One of the things that um, I can speak to is the work that I did in my nonprofit role before I joined Facebook, and I work with many companies, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, and I'm excited about now that I'm in my role of head of women's safety at Facebook, 
really bringing together all of these tech companies in the same way that that the technology companies have come together about child sexual abuse images. There are really phenomenal connections that are 20 years old where these companies have been coming together to figure out how to handle child abuse. And they sit around the table as part of the technology coalition. They share hashes, of digital fingerprints, um, to make sure that images don't get continued to be aren't shared. And so I am very optimistic that we can bring together the staff in every company that are addressing violence against women, gender-based violence. And as far as I know, no company has hired somebody with the title head of women's safety beyond Facebook. There are people addressing these issues inside those companies. I've worked with them in my, you know, my past nonprofit life. And you know, we're talking about how can we really do some meaningful collaboration. I want to give one example of what that looks like so it's not up here sort of esoteric. And back in 2015, one of the things that I kept saying in my nonprofit role was, look, we're pleased that the companies are taking child abuse images so seriously. That's such important work. However, we need you to take more seriously the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. This is something that abusers and stalkers are misusing to, to shame and humiliate and truly harm um, adult victims, and we need the companies to step up. So Facebook actually took the lead and said, we will host a convening. We will invite Microsoft, Twitter, Reddit, all of them, and will you come present? And so it was us and several other NGOs from around the world then presented to this room full of technology companies about the harms caused by non-consensual intimate images. And it was really NGO experts informing the technology companies for their policies. And within three months, every major tech company changed their policies to say that they would no longer allow non-consensual Im intimate images to stay on the, their platforms if reported. And, you know, we were all doing cartwheels. Like, you know, we, we saw the power of NGOs coming together and saying, this is important. Can you, you know, change your policies? That, of course, didn't solve all the issues. One of the things that Facebook rolled out in 2017 was using hashes, those digital fingerprints that I talked about with child abuse images, to make sure that once you report that intimate image, it's hashed and goes into an image bank. And so then it doesn't keep coming back up on the platform over and over. And in my super optimistic heart is what I really want is Facebook has a pilot initiative with Nigat as part of um, the Digital Rights Foundation and other groups um, at ECPAT in Taiwan as part of this pilot. Um, we are actually allowing survivors to proactively hash those images if they don't, if they can't sleep at night because they're worried that images are going to be posted and their family will see it, their employers will see it, anyone will see it. We want to be able to create a hash to store the image and then use that digital fingerprint to keep it from ever seeing the light of day. But in an ideal world, we would have a central NGO partner who's sort of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children partner who sends the hashes to all the tech companies. And then those images don't appear anywhere. So that's something we're working towards. We're in very preliminary conversations, but it would be exciting to be able to help survivors sleep better at night knowing their images are not going to show up. Mm. Very good, very good. Okay, so you're, I appreciate that you're conveying a sense of hope. <laughs> I always like to convey a sense of hope that, that we are making progress and that together we are approaching a better, you know, a better scenario where we can be more effective. I mean, we know this problem feels sometimes just wildly out of control. And uh, it, 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 it helps to know that there are strategies, there are partnerships, there are people that are taking this very, very seriously, including, uh, you know, at Facebook, and, and we know that other platforms are, are, doing, are doing similar work, and, and there's a lot of attention to AI and machine learning uh, to, help, to help bring this together. But as you say, it's not, it's not the full solution. We still need to, to have these interactions among us to be able to identify and, and take down this content and also to prevent. I mean, I think, you know, the message here is very clearly that we need to get better at the response, but we also need to, to, to not let go of our ambitions to prevent and, and to be able to build evidence that allows us to know that we're making the progress that we need to be making around that. Uh, so thank you for those, those welcome remarks and, and a bit of update in terms of how things are going uh, among partnerships. Uh, to handle this issue better, Cindy. Thank you.
Um, okay, so I'm now going to turn attention to uh, back to Jiso Yoon. This is the final recommendation I'm going to ask uh, someone to respond to. So this recommendation is around uh, needing further interaction among states, online platforms, and other structures. And the recommendation is as follows. States should clearly set out the expectation that all business enterprises in their territory and or jurisdiction respect human rights throughout their operations. To this end, states should provide effective guidance to businesses on how to respect human rights uh, through their operations and encourage or require businesses to address their impact on human rights. So my question for you, Jiso, what steps need to be taken and can you share any lessons and practices from the South Korea experience? Over to you. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so in Korea, there is, there is a, a, an independent organization called the Korea Communications uh, Commission. And this um, organization acts as a leading agency in working with online platforms to set legal safety standards and uh, to enforce those uh, agreed standards based on reporting and monitoring. And in addition to this uh, government agency, um, uh, going, going back to this partnership uh, uh, amongst um, online platforms, there is an organization called Korea Internet Self-Governance Organization that consists just of uh, online platforms that work together amongst themselves to develop self-regulation mechanisms. And so thanks to these kinds of efforts, now several online platforms in South Korea, and particularly the well-known ones in the country, have developed guidelines and policies related to harmful contents and makes these guidelines uh, public, publicly ava available to all viewers and creators. Um, but but um, many difficulties still remain. And so first and foremost, uh, many of these online platforms still find it challenging to define what harm harmful content is and specifically what contents should be uh, blocked or taken down. So there's the definition problem. Um, another problem is that um, clear guidelines and policies are only effective and meaningful if they're accompanied by monitoring efforts. And uh, monitoring harmful contents uh, requires resources. And many of these online platforms um, are uh, not very um, resourceful to hire a big team to care of this matter. And also um, nudging some of the better known platforms to self-regulate might be somewhat effective, but there's always a chance that new platforms uh, that lie beyond the reach of this self-regulation will emerge. And finally, um, as we know, large amounts of harmful contents are created, transmitted, and consumed internationally. And, and this means that um, creators, distributors, and consumers do not necessarily live in the same jurisdictional boundary, which makes it challenging. And so um, I think it's important for future policies to consider th these factors into account. Hey, thank you so much, Jiso, for these reflections and insights based on uh, your experience and what you've seen uh, unfold in South Korea. Um, I mean, I think the issue around self-regulation uh, is a really, really important one. We need to continue uh, giving this attention uh, and recognize, as you've pointed out, that we need to see an interplay of self-regulation and then regulation that's really established by the state where companies are perhaps not meeting uh, the standard that, that uh, you know, that meets the reality and meets the needs of, of survivors of this type of violence. Um, so that's, um, that's well appreciated. Okay, so, so now that we've heard from all of, all of the uh, speakers in today's uh, cyber chat, I want to offer you all a chance to, to have a few reactions to each other. So we now have a few minutes in our in our planned agenda where we would um, allow panelists to respond to things that others have said, as well as um, to respond to um, some questions that have come into the chat. So we have noted your questions. Some of them have been responded to in the chat. 
some of them have been responded to already, as Cindy Cindy already verbally responded to one of your one of your remarks. Um, and so I'm going to first turn to Jalen. Uh, there was a question in the chat about um, whether this is an inter this is a generational problem. And so I'm going to ask Jalen to uh, respond to this question. I will read it out. Um, as well as offer any other uh, reflections to some of the other speakers if you would like to. And so the question is this, how much of the problem of this problem do you think is a generational problem? Do older generations who run the government courts and law enforcement understand the seriousness of online violence? That's a great question. Do they have enough understanding to make this issue a policy priority? So I wanna give a couple minutes to Jalen to, um, to, to offer your, your remarks. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I think what we what this research wanted to highlight, and in uh, and, uh, and in other related ICT related viol violence against women uh, and girls research is that violence against women is continuum and it's intergenerational, and I think uh, that's the reason why if violence is happening in a particular generation, that must be stopped and that must be addressed, or else it will continue and pass on to, to the next generation. And I think this is what some studies say, uh, actually mentioned about intergenerational cost. No? Um, and therefore, I think that's the reason why we need to really expose this kind of, uh, this kind of problem so that government must address it and look at it. No? And um, economically, how it also impact the, the economy uh, if there are a lot of violence committed in a particular community. So the question is how uh, do older generations who run the government, uh, blah, 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 are serious or understand? That's what actually I, what I was trying to say in my last uh, intervention, that because there's no physical body that we're talking, talking, uh, talking uh, some law enforcers look at it as a minor violence or trivialize uh, ICT-related violence against women. And that's actually what women's groups and in the Philippines are actually trying to highlight that whether it's an online and offline, it's still violence against women at, and must be addressed. No? And that's what we are, why we are continually uh, engaging and having a dialogue with government agencies because um, most of the, the comments of um, victim survivors are that they were not treated properly by some law enforcement agencies because their reports are being seen as trivial. I think that's something that we can change in this discussion, that ICT vouchers is not a trivial issue and it's an important issue that must be addressed, similar with offline violence against women. Well said, Jalen, thank you. Um, yeah, you, what you've said has a lot of resonance and I think we've certainly heard that, um, I mean, we, uh, Zari, when she gave her presentation today, she really tried to help us understand, you know, all the myriad forms of online violence and the harm that comes. I mean, I think we've given this a very quick, you know, treatment and there's so much more to understand about how harmful this type of violence is and how it really stops women from, uh, you know, living their lives fully, uh, from, you know, reducing their, their presence online and to really changing the way that they live their lives because of fear of harm. Uh, as well. So, you know, that this needs to be taken much more seriously, I think is, is, uh, is very much, uh, is very much true. And we appreciate your underlining that. Um, so I have uh, a, perhaps another question this time for uh, Cindy. I know, Cindy, you've responded to uh, one or two things already when you spoke, but this is related to uh, being part of the private social media sector do you think additional government regulations help or hurt social media companies' approach to curbing ICT violence? And then additionally, what recommendations do you have for policy to keep up with the fast changing nature of the internet? So Cindy, over to you for this question, as well as any other responses you wanna to make to some of the other speakers. Sure. Um, as a relatively new employee of Facebook, I honestly am curious to see how this plays out in different countries where regulations and legislation is happening. I can say that from my time in the nonprofit sector, watching regulations and legislation being made was a little terrifying. Things were being changed at the last minute. Um, sometimes special interest groups had the ear of the legislator or the regulator. And so from a victim advocate standpoint, we were sometimes appalled with what came out in the final version. So 
I honestly just don't know whether legislation or regulation would assist us or be harmful. Um, I can speak to recommendations of keeping up with the fast pace of internet. And ironically, my suggestion from my previous life in the nonprofit sector is to write legislation as open-ended as possible and don't get stuck in the technology. We would frequently have police officers sort of throw their hands up in the air and say, technology, you know, legislation hasn't kept up with technology. There's nothing we can do. Prosecutors would say the same thing. So would judges. And I was just like, look, it's harassment, whether it's online or offline, there's a harassment law and it doesn't care where you harass. It's stalking, no matter where you do it. It's surveillance, no matter where you do it. It's hacking, no matter how you do it. And so I would get really frustrated when people were afraid of technology and would try to use the fact that the law hadn't kept up. That being said, there are certain areas like non-consensual sharing of intimate images where the law really does need to have sometimes be tweaked because of just the nature of the previous laws didn't take into account the non-consensual sharing of images. It wasn't as widespread back in the day when it was happening with Polaroid pictures. So, you know, yes, tweaking sometimes is helpful, but I, I encourage everybody to go to your existing, you know, laws in your community and just dig around and see what fits the current behavior and then pull it out and go to your prosecutor or your law enforcement friends and say, do you think this could work for online violence against women? Because I think it would. And we've had judges ordering offenders as part of the protection order that you will not contact her. And that includes on the Twitter and that includes on the Facebook. So if you can get a judge engaged, they can actually use their protection orders rather creatively. Mm, mm. That's a really welcome addition to the conversation today, Cindy. I mean, I think as we were preparing for this session and talking amongst us, uh, among the different speakers, we had a fair bit of discussion around can, you know, how are, existing laws and policies being utilized to address forms of violence that may not be explicitly named in the legislation. And we heard from people in different contexts that in some cases, yes, existing legislation is, is, is viable, right? It can be used to address stalking and various forms of abuse and violence. But as you pointed out, in some cases, we need to craft or update legislation, amend legislation to be able to meet these specific needs or, or gaps that, that are not being met by existing legislation. So, so thanks for pointing out those, those issues. Um, so now I'm gonna turn to uh, Nikat. There was a question um, in the, in the Q&A about uh, any reliable apps on sexual harassment for survivors. And I know that you may have some insights from the Pakistan experience Nigat, would you like to respond to that question and feel free to also respond to anything that other speakers have said? Over to you. Thank you, Melissa. So uh, um, we basically, it, it's not an app, but uh, uh, an online portal to address sexual harassment uh, against women, uh, especially at workplace. So one um, a trend that we have seen that um, uh, you under me to women have been, uh, you know, speaking about their experiences, naming their perpetrators online, and as a uh, retaliation to that act, uh, they have been facing. Um, they, they were slapped by defamation suits. So to address that certain issue, we started um, an online portal called, it's, it, in Urdu it's called Abornahi, but in English it means time's up. And the portal has a list of pro bono lawyers uh, and with their you know, um, uh, bios and what they have done in their work. So any survivor can go to the portal, click on the uh, uh, and, uh, a lawyer's bio and then reach out to them directly. So not necessarily related to the defamation suits, but also can ask them about sexual harassment or online violence or any uh, issue uh, of violence that they are fa facing online and offline, specifically related to sexual harassment. Uh, it's a voluntary initiative because of course, you know, like we didn't have resources to create one and it was a need of time, but it also has resources uh, uh, um, around, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sexual, the 
laws around sexual harassment, the, the, a toolkit, how people can sort of address such, such kind of issues. So, you know, there is, there is this kind of portal and maybe, you know, uh, I think we need to talk more about these local initiatives so that others can also replicate and see how they can model keeping their context in mind and, uh, you know, start uh, the one like this. But I would also say that I, it's important to, uh, for the donors and the uh, INGOs to, uh, to give resources to the local people so that they can initiate local uh, responses and solutions because most of the time uh, there is like western solutions coming into the country like parachuting and people are like oh you know we do not resonate with these kind of solutions so yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair point, fair point Nirat, that yes we need to be resourcing local actors with local solutions so um, thank you for that and it's good to know that about this um, this uh, pivoting in the direction of supporting uh, survivors with pro bono legal support. I mean, there's a number of countries have are taking this approach and perhaps we will see a, a positive cycle forming where the experiences of women and victims and survivors will be able to inform how policies and legislation are, are utilized and how, how laws are applied. Um, so I'm watching the clock. I have my eyes on the clock. I wanted to thank you all for your um, input so far. I'm going to turn now to Jiso. I don't know that we have a specific question for you so far, but I wanted to just offer you an opportunity to say um, a couple, uh, to respond to anything that others have said or any other points that have been raised in this session. So over to you, Jiso. Um, well, um, I um, just uh, want to make a comment uh, regarding what Jalen said at the very beginning about the importance of the youth um, and um, the teenagers. Um, and we already know that uh, teenagers and the youth are um, heavy consumers of online content. And we already know from a number of studies that they are uh, exposed quite often to violent contents and harmful contents. And I think um, I think it's important to in engage them. I, I don't know if educating them is the right word, but of, of course, raising awareness um, among young people to um, consume uh, in the right manner, to create in the right manner, to distinguish credible and non-credible uh, non sources of information. Mm -hmm. Very good, yes, thank you. Um, you know, sometimes I, I think of this issue of online safety is a little bit like how we engage with our children and young people related to sex and healthy relationships. You know, we should not expect this them, them to magically, you know, absorb, you know, all the right information. We, we need to be talking to them about it, right? In order to form healthy relationships, what does that look like? What, how do we, ex what are our expectations? Um, how, what would we do if we felt unsafe? You know, how, what does consent mean? So there's very similar parallels here into how we speak with our young people, coach our young people to be safe online and to treat others safely, right? We have to build those expectations and we have to build that through discussion and dialogue and to do so with young people. Our research has cert certainly pointed us in the direction of speaking to younger and younger people about uh, both boys and girls, about um, healthy relationships, healthy sexuality, consent, you know, this is something that we know that we need to be doing. And, and I guess as, as parents and as, as, as family members of young people, we need to, to get better at that. Um, so thank you all for your insights. Um, we, are, we are approaching the end of our time. And so I'm going to offer um, an enormous thanks uh, from us to all of you for making the time uh, to participate in today's session, both the speakers and, and those of you who are also joining online. Um, as we expected, you know, we, we thought that you would be providing very rich, rich insights, which have sparked ideas for actions that we can all carry forward. We hope that today's session uh, will open up a dialogue about strategies that be, can be pursued in countries around this region and beyond to better put an end to online and offline violence against women and girls and to build the evidence that we have available to us to do that better and to learn from each other. 
So I wanna thank each speaker and participant for being here with us today as we launch this research, research study. I know that the study has been put into the link uh, into the chat and so you're, you're welcome to get it from our website. Um, we, we really want to thank Zari for this uh, collaboration and for leading this research. Once again, we thank the government of the Republic of Korea for the continuous support. Um, and on behalf of you and women, I want to wish you all an inspirational and active 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. We know every single one of us is needed and we thank all of you for what you've brought to this discussion and what you will be bringing forward as we as we continue. So thank you all for coming and we look forward to engaging with you in other ways online as we move forward. Have a good day and have a good evening. Thank you. La, 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 la.